Hello and welcome back. Today we will be continuing our Victoria 3 tutorial series and we're going to be kind of answering the question, who should I trade with? What are some good trade partners? And this sort of thing. Uh, this video will be roughly divided into four sections. The first one, uh, we're going to talk about what are some background considerations that we need to uh, be aware of before we can really talk about which ones are best. We need to first know what are we looking for in a trade partner. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about my favorite five markets to trade with and why some might miss the cut. Uh, then we'll talk talk about this idea of trade hubs or going and going out for a conquest just for the purpose of facilitating trade. And finally, we'll talk about, um, you know, some trade partners that might be good, uh, both for developing access as well as uh, to further pull into your customs union, make a subject, this type of thing, um, which is one of the things you can do with trade. Okay, so first of all, general principles, this isn't really going to be uh, as much a video on uh, how to trade uh, but in general I think the proper way to think about trade is it's not about generating as much profit as possible and instead is about uh, massaging your buy and sell orders in a particular way so that your buildings uh, in your country uh, can be skewed a particular way and what this means is that you want to use trade to create sell orders of goods you do not want to be producing yourself and you want to use trade to create buy orders of goods that you do want to be producing yourself so for example with grain specifically you do not want to have a lot of grain farms and so if you import grain this will make your auto queue produce less grain and so you will be using other people's sell orders of grains to fulfill grain needs in your market and similarly you might want to export clothes which are a finished good um, and this uh, exporting will allow there to be more buy orders in your market which will make all your textile mills more profitable which will allow you to build more of them if you do both of these in conjunction you'll have fewer grain farms and more textile mills and so you use it to manipulate the types of buildings you're having in your market more so than necessarily chasing as high a profit as possible i think this is the proper way to look at trade and this kind of informs um some of our background discussion because we are going to generally look for trade partners that are going to either sell a lot of agrarian goods or are going to eat a lot of consumer goods. And then there's kind of a third one, which is that we are generally going to prefer trade partners that will have a lot of, uh, that we can get a lot of resources off of because eventually we'll be capped by resources such as coal and iron and getting a lot of sell orders from them, even though they are capitalist owned buildings. This is the primary driver. The primary thing we're concerned about with is ownership. Even though these are capitalist owned, it's still good to encourage the AI to build these things over time. It will lead to a smoother uh, sort of thing because if we import, uh, let's say, iron from uh, the Austrians, the Austrian market will produce more iron over time. And so it will smooth out our game, even if we also want to produce a lot of iron ourselves. Okay. Uh, next up is a diplomacy is also an important consideration uh, when thinking about trade because if you get a trade agreement with someone, you will get positive uh, ticking relations. If we kind of go to, let's not, let's get out of the market tab. We have a trade agreement with the United States. And so if we take a look at our overview of the United States of America or our interactions, we will see that we are getting plus 1% progress each day for increasing relations just from our trade agreement. So trade agreements are particularly useful for maintaining good relations with countries over time. And so uh, even if you're declaring wars in areas where they have interests, so for example, if we took Mexican territory and we went to conquer Arizona, we would get an infamy penalty and this infamy penalty uh, would apply or we would also get minus relations with everyone who has an interest in this area. Now, U.S. apparently does not have an interest in this area right now, which is absolutely wild. But once they have an interest in this area, half of however much infamy you accrue, you accrue that in negative relations with anyone where you declare wars. So having trade agreements with people who have a lot of uh, interest around the world when you want to have good relations with them can help you to keep their finger out of your pie. And finally, uh, we care a lot about ease of access as far as trade partners go because every trade route that you run is either going to be a land trade route or it is going to use convoys. Uh, the amount of convoys that is required is dependent on the amount of sea nodes you have to travel. So, for example, if we did not have Canada in the market, which we do, trading with the U.S., we would have to go one, two, three, uh, you know, four, five, six trade nodes in order to get to the U.S.'s market, or maybe a little bit less if we go north, um, or we would only have to go one if we're going from the Bahamas, right, from here to here, uh, in order to get to their trade node. And so 
uh, generally speaking, uh, people who you can get sort of either just raw adjacencies towards will be preferable trade partners. And very often, you know, you will want to run trade routes up to the point uh, where you are uh, not... Uh, so you're not spending any convoys. So if we take a look at we sort by convoys required, uh, we will see that we require convoys for all of these. Uh, but very often when you reach the late game and you don't have a super large amount of convoys, you'll be doing like level six, eight routes uh, that just cap the amount of uh, level uh, while also not using any convoys. And so adjacency is a big deal. And this is why the US in particular kind of suffers is because it's hard to get an adjacency to the United States for most countries and they are tend to be kind of far away from everything uh for most countries that you might be playing okay um uh you also notably uh if we for example if we have papal states in our customs union and we have an adjacency to austria uh we only have to uh run convoys you do not spend more convoys by running a huge volume of trade to austria we only have to spend convoys based on the infrastructure here in the papal states uh if they were in our customs union we would not have to spend convoys based on the amount of overland trade that's going into the papal states and this is why having direct um overland uh sort of access to a market is going to make a huge difference uh, because you do not have to pay the convoys on the back end. Convoy payment is not based on, uh, it's just based on if the, the, the their ability to get to your, uh, your trade node, not once this node is already there, uh, how far does it have to go? Because in order to go to the Papal States, we have one, two, three, four nodes here. Um, but we do not have to pay uh, the convoys for the goods that are traveling from Austria's market. We don't have to pay for these four nodes worth uh, if we have an adjacency with the Papal States. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, so that's kind of like the background discussion and who I think the best five uh, trade partners are, are first of all, for diplomacy reasons, I think Great Britain and France are two really solid ones, but they will also be able to support um, quite a lot of trade routes in terms of uh, the arable resources, and they will also eat a lot of goods. They have relatively high standard of livings and high populations, and so you will very easily be able to you know, export clothes to them if you are focusing on making a lot of clothes cheaply. And in particular, France, uh, French pops, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, tend to have an obsession with wine so their market tends to overproduce grain in particular and so grain tends to be cheap in their market which means you can generally import it uh, let's see if we can just zoom in here and check on some of their pops uh, just to kind of check uh, yeah they have an obsession with wine they will overproduce grain and so you can import grain from them pretty comfortably they will also tend to get a lot of colonial holdings over time and they will have access to these colonial goods the UK similarly tends to have very cheap grain prices as well as cheap dye prices at the start of the game so they're actually pretty good for importing these if we come into the market it and we go for grain and we try and import I imagine there aren't gonna be too many people we can import from profitably and there's not because so much grain is getting produced over here in the East India Company uh, and so this also makes Britain a good uh, uh, trade partner but a huge one is if you can get a trade agreement with either of these guys early it will help you as the game goes on to keep the uh, relations up so they don't declare you as a rival something like this and so you hopefully have to fight them a bit less if you're playing a power where you can't really afford to do it all right next up is going to be russia and austria and for both of these uh the trade is going to be primarily because they have a ton of resources austria has a ton of iron and coal and russia has a ton of well everything um especially they have a really good comparative advantage in wood and while you do want to produce wood yourself um they can be an excellent trade partner also if you ever get them in your customs union russia has a really big population that you can use to siphon off pops and so uh russia and austria are also particularly large although getting an adjacency to russia is a bit hard we'll talk about that later and finally probably the best trade partner you can have is going to be Great Xing um, for several reasons. One, you can eventually get them in your market, which they have an enormous population for you to siphon off, and so this is particularly good. But also, let's take a look at their market. Uh, they will tend to have really cheap grain and really cheap silk and also sometimes really cheap dyes. It depends on how things go and you really want to be importing all these agrarian goods. But they also have an enormous amount of population and you can export to them very, very, very large amounts of 
clothing and furniture per export level, which is particularly nice when bureaucracy is a heavy concern, when you don't want to be running a ton of trade routes, you just want to run really big trade routes. Uh, Great Xing can absorb and dish out enormous trade routes, and so they are probably one of the best trade partners in the game. Um, you know, UK, France, Russia, and Austria, all these are GPs who are particularly helpful in wars if you can get them as an ally, and to this end, from the diplomacy spectrum, it's good, but just in terms of raw value, value of having them as a trade partner, Great Xing is probably the best. And so these are kind of the big ones. You noticed there's one that was omitted and that is the United States uh, might seem like a really good trade partner, uh, at least initially, but you usually have to spend a ton of convoys to get to them, even if you get a trade agreement. And so this is why they didn't quite make like the top five cut, or I don't even think they're number six, uh, but they do have an enormous amount of resources. So if you can somehow get an adjacency to them, uh, you know, if you're starting as the UK or Mexico, although Mexico has other problems because they don't like you, or you somehow may Manage to get, uh, you know, a piece of Mexican land. Um, you know, you can maybe go after Mexican Texas or something in the very beginning of the game. I'm not sure exactly how you'd want to go about it, but if you can get into adjacent to the USA, then they become quite a strong trade partner. Okay, let's talk about trade hubs. And so what I mean by trade hubs is I mean going after a piece of territory just for the purpose of being able to trade with someone overland so you don't have to run all these convoys. And so this can be a very strong strategy, especially if you get a ton of these, because you will be able to run a ton of trade routes uh, and really, really, really influence your markets, you know, buy and sell orders, which is kind of what it's all about. And so the first one we're going to talk about is Brunei. Now, Brunei will give you uh, land access to uh, two different markets markets that are particularly good and also Brunei is notably very nice to take. Um, for what we're looking for whenever we are looking for a sort of trade hub is we are looking for a place we can take that is extremely low infamy to take. We come in here and we look at interactions. Taking North Borneo is not a lot of infamy. The amount of infamy you pay is going to be based on both a combination of how many pops are there as well as if they're recognized or if they're major. Um, recognized powers take more infamy to take from and more populous areas take more and so generally we're looking for them being low in both these areas. When you take Brunei, in addition to it having gold, sulfur, and iron, and generally being, you know, a pretty good spot, especially if you don't have access to, uh, let's zoom in a little so we can click on the state. Uh, if you don't have access to dyes, they're particularly good. They have sulfur, iron, a, quite a bit of logging. And they will all gold will also be up here. In addition to all this, they will give you an adjacency to the Great Xing market in Lanfang because Lanfang is part of the Great Xing's market at the start of the game. And if we kind of just look around, uh, you know, the Great Xing's borders, there aren't exactly that many good spots where you could otherwise conquer in order to get an adjacency to Great Xing, other than just taking provinces off Great Xing, which is also fine but takes a lot of infamy. And so Brunei will give you direct access to Great Xing's market. Next up, uh, we have Montenegro, which if we zoom in here, just this little area, very easy to take. You just have to do a double landing. The population is only 127, so it's going to be a very small amount of infamy. If we just conquer state them. Also, you can puppet or dominion them. It seems to be the case that the AI likes going after you. If you have unrecognized subjects, Montenegro is recognized. And so just dominioning them or puppeting them is fine, although they'll have a bunch of revolutions later. And what you get with Montenegro is an adjacency to both the Ottoman market and the Austrian market. And there's not really another good way to get an adjacency to the Austrian market in particular. Um, you can go after Modena. This is probably the next best spot. But it will incur quite a bit of more infamy. Dominioning Montenegro was 3 infamy. This is 6.4. And so you have to pay a lot more for this adjacency here. Um, next up, we have Zulu. Uh, which Zulu has a decent amount of population. And so perhaps this is not the best example. But Zulu will give you an adjacency to the UK. Now notably, you'll have an adjacency with the UK with a lot of games anyways because the UK just has a huge adjacency generally they're really easy to trade with but Zulu is also going to give you access military access into Transvaal and Orangey which are some of the best provinces to take in the game so if I ever needed to try and develop an adjacency with the UK I think this would be the best way to do it it also gives you an adjacency to Portugal which is actually pretty tough to get because you either have to go for Congo Zulu or I think there's a place around here where you can maybe colonize next to like right here uh, to get an adjacency to Portugal, but other than that, it's hard to get an adjacency to Portugal. So Zulu is a pretty good trade hub. Um, you can conquer it, you can dominion them. Uh, it's not a lot of infamy either way because they are unrecognized, uh, even though their population is a little bit higher. 
If you want to get an adjacency to France, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, for the most part, the easiest way to get an adjacency with France, you can go after Algeria. This is kind of okay. They're not too expensive to Dominion, but the easiest way is just going to be uh, establishing a colony next to one of their colonies, and then you can trade with them uh, a little bit easier. Uh, for getting an adjacency to... Uh, Prussia, this is a little bit tough. Uh, my impression is if you take some of these Prussian states, uh, they will get a sort of negative uh, attitude towards you uh, because they want to take your states. And so taking something like Mecklenburg is not as appealing. Also, Mecklenburg is going to be, you know, 14 infamy to take. Uh, it's going to be 5.4 infamy to Dominion. This is kind of okay. But I think the best option if you're trying to get an adjacency to Prussia is going to be actually Dominioning the Netherlands. And the reason why is you can't can't Dominion Netherlands at the start uh, because they are a major power, but usually they will decay to being a minor power. And once they decay to being a minor power, then you can Dominion them. It will cost less infamy if they're minor. It'll be like low 20s usually. Uh, but if you get them as a subject, you acquire all of their subjects, which includes getting all of the Dutch East Indies uh, as your subject, which requires way more infamy than going after the Netherlands. You can see if we were to try and, let's see, transfer subject. Oh, we can't do this war goal, but uh, let's see. Transfer subject. If we were to go for transfer subject on them, it would be 70 infamy, a whopping 70 infamy. And so you can get an enormous market expansion with going after the Netherlands specifically. So I think if you want an adjacency sp specifically to Prussia, that this is the most efficient way to go about it, even though this is obviously the most violent um, sort of trade hub we've discussed. Um... Another one I like in particular is Nejd, uh, because it will not talk, take a lot of infamy to take both of their states, both Hail and Nejd. It will be around 8 to 9 infamy, but it will give you an adjacency with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it will also give you an adjacency with the UK, because the Trucal Coast is a protectorate of the UK oh, at the start, and I believe they're considered adjacent. Um, but uh, this road lies to you. It's not adjacent to Bahrain, at least in terms of land military. But Nejd will also have an enormous amount of oil later on in the game uh, and so while they look like they don't have that many resources now uh, wait until you wait until they get a bunch of oil um, so Nejd is also good and next up we kind of have a sort of triple idea here where puppeting New Granada is actually pretty solid uh, because eventually you'll be able to go after the Panama Canal just taking Panama doesn't feel quite as good um, you could just take Panama this is eight infamy uh, going after Dominion is 14 infamy and so Dominion in New Granada and then eventually accessing, uh, annexing them is good for a couple reasons. It will give you an adjacency to the eventual Peru, Bolivia, Brazil Venezuela. It will give you access to um, making the Panama Canal and you can also snake your way eventually through Central America Another good one to go for is Guatemala because this will give you an adjacency to Mexico. If you can get Mexico in the Customs Union, then you can get access to the United States again. And this might be kind of the most consistent or best way to get access to the United States market uh, while being able to spend zero convoys or lower convoys. If you just have, you know, Guatemala, it's still, you won't have to travel too far in terms of the amount of nodes required. And so it won't be too, too many convoys. Uh, for this and then also going after Costa Rica is also okay Costa Rica will be spit out here uh, But this will give you an adjacency to New Granada if you wanted to try and diplomatically go after New Granada instead of conquering them But if you're kind of wanting to get a spot in here in uh, in the Americas I think that this kind of block is pretty good uh, South Africa. I think going after Zulu uh, if you're going after North Africa, you know, uh I think Tripolitania's land is pretty good, but this doesn't give you a ton of good adjacencies. Algeria gives you a few adjacencies. Notably, it does not give you an adjacency to Spain. Um, Spain has a ton of uh, different adjacencies all over the place, so they're probably not the hardest to get to. Uh, but I think you get the general idea of going for areas that are going to be really low infamy grabs for the purpose specifically of um, gaining an adjacency. I think Montenegro is probably the best example of this, where you wouldn't normally go for Montenegro, but the adjacency to Austria is really, really, really good. Okay, so now let's talk about future subjects. And probably the best way, if you're just looking for who would be good to get into my customs union, the best thing you can do is you can just come in here and you can sort by population. And these are going to be the best people to get in your customs union because one of the biggest advantages of having someone in your customs union, in addition to their consumption allowing you to specialize more. Uh, so for example, if we have a big country in our customs union, uh, we can uh, build more clothing and focus on more clothing and then they will end up building grain. And so this allows 
allows us to have, again, the uh, main idea we want to uh, manipulate the buy and sell orders. This will allow us to be producing less of the sell orders for stuff like grain, fabric, and these sorts of stuff, and producing more of the sell orders for stuff that is more capitalist oriented because of the investment pool differences. Um, so coming back into it, uh, one of the best ways to look at it, other than that, which is pretty good, is going to be just sorting by who has the most population. And the reason why is you can siphon off pops from anyone who's in your customs union. 1.2, they significantly uh, nerf mass migration, but regular migrations still work. And so we're going to kind of go through some of my very favorite people to try and trade with to pull into the customs union. And the first off we're going to start with is a bit of honorable mention with the Japanese shogunate, uh, which you cannot trade with at the start. But if you've accrued a lot of infamy and you want to do a low infamy war, opening Japan's market and then also getting war reps off of them is pretty good because their GDP is quite sizable. Uh, GDP or GDP is what determines how much war reps they will pay. And while a lot of this GDP is coming from the subsistence rice farms, they'll still pay out quite a lot. And so just opening their market, going for their war reps can be good. And then you trade a lot with them and you look to siphon off their pops eventually. Notably, uh, the East India Company, which normally you can't get in that easily, uh, will not allow you to siphon off a lot of their pops because they discriminate against a lot of their pops and they have migration controls. Okay, next up, we have uh, the Ottomans are also particularly good uh, for going after to get into your customs union. And one of the big, there's a lot of reasons why the Ottomans are good. Uh, the Ottomans uh, notably have adjacencies to a ton of other guys who would be really nice to get into your customs union or to trade with and have an adjacency towards. They give you a Russia adjacency, they give you an Austria adjacency, they give you an Egypt adjacency, and they give you a Persia adjacency. Also, um, you know, if you can eventually turn them into a subject, if they drip uh, below to minor power, eventually, if you can get them as a subject, this is really good. Often they will be defending the borders, so it can be a little bit difficult to go after um, trying to protectorate them, uh, which you can't even see up here because they are a major power right now. Uh, but if you can get this, they have some. They have the one of the largest supplies of oil in the game in all the Iraqi states over here, and so they are pretty good on this front. In addition to having a huge population. Uh, next up is kind of a weird one to get to, and that is the Sikh Empire. Along with the Sikh Empire, just kind of all of Central Africa, or Central Africa, Central Asia here is good to think about getting. Uh, just kind of cruising in, either conquering Macron, uh, Kalat, Afghanistan, and then getting into the Sikh Empire. The Sikh Empire notably has a really, really large population that they do not discriminate against, and so you can uh, try and get these guys into your customs union uh, so that you can siphon off their pops, and this is particularly good. Uh, it will require a little bit of work, but this is kind of a low infamy expansion route if you want to just conquer it. Or these are really cheap uh, bankrolls. They don't have a lot of GDP. And so you can bankroll and then pull in your customs union pretty effectively up in through here. And so if you're not making a lot of money and you just unlock bankrolls, this is kind of one of the softer, easier spots to get into. And it will also very, very notably give you access to opium as well with all of these states. And so they can be really good to pull in. And then you pull in Sikh Empire for the pops. Next up, while we're here, we should talk about Persia, which is a good one to get in. They don't have quite as much population, and so it's less about the pops and more about the fact that you would eventually want to get these guys as a puppet. Now, they will be defending the borders quite often, so it will be hard to make them into a protectorate. Uh, if we come in here and we will see, they are not wanting to accept, and it can be very, very difficult while they still have the strategy of pursuing defending the borders. But if you can get them in, uh, they are extremely good because they have a ton of oil that appears here. They have a decent amount of other resources. They give adjacencies to Russia and the Ottoman Empire, and so they're just very, very solid and good to get in. They also have a decent amount of population. Um, Ones that are kind of easier to maybe be able to protect it because they do not defend the borders too much, but also are quite large uh, in terms of population as well as market are Spain and Portugal. Uh, generally speaking, uh, more uh, recognized countries tend to defend the border less as well as less conservative ones. And so if you can get these guys in their customs union, uh, they will have uh, generally a higher standard of living. They will be able to consume a lot uh, more goods and then also um, you can look to eventually uh, you know dominion slash protectorate them uh, because they are kind of some of the bigger powers that are not uh, 
you know, like any one of these, pulling them into your market is generally pretty good. There's some of the bigger boyos that are still willing to play ball, and they will give you a ton of adjacencies. Um, you know, Spain has a bunch of stuff all over the place. They have the Philippines, and so getting them into as either a protectorate or a subject uh, includes not only them, but also their subjects as well, and so this will be good. And Portugal in particular, if you can get them as a protectorate early, uh, this is quite nice. You notice this is only minus 65, and we're not even friendly on them. Uh, it, and they're not even in our customs union, so protectorating Portugal uh, early would be pretty easy. It only gives six infamy, and after we do this, we can dominion them, and it'll only take a quarter of the infamy, so that's 11 infamy, and we can, in time for malaria prevention, annex Portugal and get all of this extra frontage into the Congo. And so Portugal can be a really good one if you are particularly strong in the early game for trying to get all of this land before the, you know, kind of land grab in Africa jumps off uh, because this will give you a lot more access into these areas. Okay, finally, um, let's talk, or not finally yet, we have one more to talk about, and then we're going to talk about the best one. Mexico is also a really good partner to trade with and to try and pull into your customs union, because if you can get Mexico into your customs union, you get an adjacency with the U.S. Also, there's a decent amount of resources in Mexico, depending on how successful the U.S. has been. Um, and if they have access to, you know, Nevada and California still, uh, this will be an enormous amount of gold, which if you can protect her at Mexico uh, and look to, you know, dominion them relatively early, it's not going to be a huge amount of infamy, uh, a dominion or a puppet on Mexico. And so similar to Portugal, if you can get them in really early, um, they will often not be defending the borders, but they will also often be defending the borders. Mexico a little bit more than most recognized countries, but again, recognized countries tend to def defend the border less. Uh, you might be able to get them as a protectorate slash puppet, and this will be particularly large. And finally, the best person to get in your customs union, yep, is Great Xing. So Great Xing, if we take a look at their politics, uh, they have no migration controls, and they have the largest population in the game. And so if you can ever get Great Xing into your market while being multicultural, it's just free pops. Uh, they also generally have exactly what you're looking for in terms of market because they will tend to build a lot of grain and silk and dyes and these are exactly the goods you are looking for to kind of manipulate the buy and sell orders in your market and so great shing is just absolutely positively like the best person you can get into your market you siphon off pops now you since they will be a major power and they will generally maintain a major power you won't be able to protect them after pulling them into your customs union but they're still just insanely good to have in your customs union and you will want to trade with them in order to facilitate all this um i think probably i should have emphasized this more earlier uh when you're doing a large trade with someone it is easier to pull them into your customs union when you pull someone in your customs union it's easier to protect her at them and then once you protect her at them you can uh get a 75 percent discount on the price of dominioning them and then once you dominion them uh you will get uh you will be able to annex them following that so for example it's 30 infamy uh to dominion them just straight up uh but it would be like eight or something like this uh if they were already a protectorate and then annexing them after doing this it would be another eight and so um or was it a little bit more than eight i think it's a little bit more uh yeah it's gonna be more but right yeah it's more but and still not a lot of infamy, uh, you know, to be able to go after them uh, in this way. And so this is kind of why going after some of these ones is particularly good. Um, notably Persia and like uh, Mexico are some of the bigger ones that you can kind of go over with, go for with the intent to annex. But they also are giving you very important adjacencies. Um, I hope this video was informative uh, slash interesting. If you liked it, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And other than that, other than that, have a good day.